So we're talking about applying workshop safety precautions. Now this is a part that is very important when you're considering working in the workshop, or rather performing various works inside a workshop, a very busy workshop. So we're going to look at some of the standards that are international, acceptable and um, safety precautions that we can consider to be general. Others you can apply when you are at a particular work area. Now the, the usual precaution that should never be forgotten is that safety always comes first. Because if you don't consider safety, you have a problem. You have damages, you have injuries, you have a lot of losses that will occur to your equipment. So if you look at the definition of safety, it says a condition of being protected from or likely to cause danger. Now it works well when you look at the other side, because if you want to be protected from what? From various safety hazards. And that's where we have those hazards you can see there. Some could be lifting heavy objects, others could be things that can knock against your head. Others could be slippery floors. Others, uh, we have other hazards where you can get entangled and you fall. Or steep stairs and, and so forth. So those are hazards. When you talk about a hazard, you're referring to an object or a situation or even behavior that, that can cause injury, ill health, or even damage to property, including the environment then that is a hazard. Now the likelihood of you coming in contact with a hazard or interacting with a potential area or environment where something bad is likely to happen, that is what we consider to be risk. The potential for you or the, the likelihood that such a situation will happen. So in, in short, others simply say, this is a situation that involves exposure to a hazard, that's risk. Now let's talk about general workshop uh, precautions. We're talking about do's and don'ts. What are some things that you're not supposed to do and things that you are supposed to do when you're working inside the workshop? Well, first of all, housekeeping is very important. You have to ensure that all the tools, items, everything that you're working on is neat. So you have to keep your workshop neat and clean. If there are spillages of oil, those should be avoided because somebody can slip off and fall. And like you can see in the other picture there, the top picture, putting on PPE, it's not negotiable. You have to be in the full PPE whenever you are working in, or whenever you're performing a, a task. Then we also have the issue of running in the workshop. The caution here is that you're not supposed to run, you should walk. Because when you are running, the likelihood of bumping into things or even bumping into others and causing an accident is very high. Now, if you look at the picture just below the one we have on top, that is an example of horseplay. When you take a look, you'll find that this man is stepping on the forklift. Who does that? And it's in motion. If he falls, what may happen next? Well, it's a dangerous situation. What about those of us with long hair or loose clothing? For loose clothing, you make sure that it's tight enough. It shouldn't be loose on your body because it can get entangled in moving parts. For long hair, it should be tied and you should ensure that you wear a cap. If you can't do that, then you're better off cutting it off and ensuring that it's short. The danger is that your hair can get entangled in moving parts of a machine. <clears throat> In an automotive workshop, you may find a lift, or you may find that maybe those trucks that 
carry loads, it is lifted up. You do not need to stand under a boom, a bucket, a trailer, or a lift. That is a potential source of danger or a hazard. You don't have to do that. What if you're working on a machine? Well, there are a number of them. And what we just picked here is a sample. The first one is that you have to inspect and make sure that all the safety hazard and has the, the, the covers that are there to keep the safety of the equipment there in place. In this case, we're talking about, um, for example, if we are in, on a vehicle, you find that some of the covers that are there to insulate the positive against touching against metal, they have been removed. You make sure they are all in place. All safety guards should be where they are supposed to be. When you're operating a machine, follow the instructions that are the manufacturer recommends. If not, then you land into a problem. Moving parts, always keep your hands away from those parts which are moving because that's quite dangerous. And this one is one thing we talked about that always make sure that you're, where you're working, the place is neat and well lit, like we can see in that picture below there. Then if there are any hazardous materials, make sure they are kept away from where you're working or they are secured in a way that they cannot cause danger. If you have a screwdriver, make sure it is used for the intended purpose. If it's a grinder, it should work as a grinder. Not using one piece of equipment for what it was not designed. That again, may cause serious problems with damage and accidents. <clears throat> now look at the last one. If you don't know how to stop that equipment, then don't start it. Because when it's in motion, then you struggle and you can cause a lot of damage and uh, serious accidents can happen. And sometimes inf even fatalities can follow. Now, this is the interesting part that you need to look out for. The safety colors. What are some colors of safety? I'll just sample the first three. I'm sure it's been common. You've heard about it when they say red for danger. So in safety, health, and the environment, when we talk about red, this one is used to show danger or alert people that they need to stop. There's a potential source of danger nearby. If you look at orange, this one is an alert next to the red. I'm sure you, you can see how they, they are coming out similar. This one is used to alert people that they are dangerous parts of machine or equipment. And again, we can, it's also said that this is also used for warning signs and labels when a hazard may result in death or serious injury. Meaning when you are in this area, you have to work very safely. You have to be alert. But the over risk does not qualify it to be in the red category. Yellow, this one is a general question. I'm sure you've seen it many times for physical hazards, including striking against objects or stumbling, falling, tripping. We can even include slipping over and falling. That is yellow. When you come to green, green is for general safety signs. So here you have safety related information that is relayed in certain areas that could be hazardous. So when you read, it will tell you what you need to do or the precautions that you need to follow. When we talk about blue, black, white, or rather, first of all, let's pick up uh, blue. In the case of blue, it's there to communicate information that is not even related to safety or personal injuries. For instance, it may show where the smoking bays are, the best work practices, and so forth. So we have black, white, purple. These can be used according to yourself as a user, the description that you may set up as a workplace, you may decide to employ this one. But one example is that black and white signs, they're used for labels against or for, for guiding traffic or telling people which direction to go. 
This is a summary of the color coding. So there you can see that red for danger, orange, just next to red and yellow, that is for specific phys physical hazards. Then of course, green is for general information and blue, this one information that is not even related to safety, maybe it should be policy related. Paper going down, paper gray, black and white, those are used according to what you at the workplace may decide. That is what we can refer to as user discretion. Safety signs. Now we're just coming from the coding. This time when we, when we talk about the signs, there are three aspects. We've already talked about this color, but there are also shapes. And of course, we'll talk about an example. When you see a circle, with a diagonal inside like that. It means this is prohibited. If we draw a person there inside, it means this is not a place for maybe walking or people shouldn't pass there. Here it is saying smoking is prohibited. Then if you come to the next one, this is a circle, blue circle telling you that this is mandatory action. It has to be carried out. If you see there, eye protection, circled blue, ensuring that whenever you are working in this particular area, it is mandatory that you put on eye protection or goggles. The next one is a triangle, a equilateral one. It's a warning and it's in yellow. Of course, like we said about yellow, yellow is used for general warning signs. It's used for general warning signs. Now here, what you see is a typical example, collateral triangle and inside there's a flaming fire saying there's a danger of flammable material. What about a square? A square is information about safe condition, meaning this is a safe, a, a typical example there, easy. This is where you should go in case of an emergency, run this route. So information about it, the safe condition that you should uh, carry out. Now red is quite interesting. We said red is for danger, it represents many things, but when you see it in a square like that, it is fire safety. And the typical example is where you are going to find a fire extinguisher. That's the color you will find right there. So these are some of the safety colors and the shapes that are applied. But when you come to the symbols that are used in safety, they are many and they are tailored to the environment where you're working. So we cannot uh, take too much time going into those because um, we will find time where we can sample them, those that relate to our field. All right, for now we can end here. Please feel free to bring out, oh, I almost forgot. There's one very important item, your first aid kit. The first aid kit is interesting because it allows you to ensures that you are ready in case of an emergency. What we are focusing on is what should be inside that first aid box or the, the kit. Well, for starters, this one should always be kept in a dry, cool place, away from where children can reach. Now, what should that box contain? It should have plasters, then sterile gauze dressings, at least, two sterile eye dressings, triangle bandages, crepe rod bandages, safety pins, disposable sterile gloves, tweezers. You can talk about scissors, uh, alcohol-free cleansing wipes, sticky tape, thermometer, skin rash cream, and all that. Painkillers, distilled water for cleaning wounds, eye wash, including eye bath. Well, this, this looks a bit boring. Let's look at um, the actual picture. These are the ones you can see here. Typical example, you have a thermometer there, safety pins, 
you have antiseptic wipes, emergency blanket, bandages, adhesive, gloves. And don't forget emergency contact information. You can also have a manual of how to go about using some of the, the things found inside there. So this one is very important because whenever an emergency occurs, you need somewhere to start from. If you have no materials, you don't even need to ask if there is a first aider somewhere because they will have no tools to use. They will not do a good job. So this is mandatory for a work area. You need to have a first aid kit, fully stocked. Expired materials, remove them and replace them with materials that are still active and ready for use. Now I can say this is the end of the lesson and thank you very much. We we'll meet in the next lesson.